much, Matteo. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you've all had a nice uh, weekend. Uh, so, uh, before we start going on with uh, today's topic, today we're going to discuss more Bayesian computations with uh, Gaussians, and uh, uh, we'll look a little bit at, we'll introduce also the more general concept of what a conjugate model is. Uh, because obviously this is particularly relevant for the Gaussian distribution. Uh, but before we start with all that, um, do people have questions about uh, last week's material? I'll start getting the screen shared. Uh, I think the easiest thing to do as usual is just to unmute yourself and ask um, rather than um, posting in the chat, but if you prefer to post in the chat for whatever reason, so also do that. I'll try to keep an eye for when things flash up. So is there a question? I did I hear someone unmuting herself, himself or herself or was, or was that Matteo being uh, inadvertently? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, we found the culprits there. Good. So more Bayesian computations with Gaussians. Yeah? Turn the pen on. There. Days with Gaussians. Okay, so the typical observation that uh, the typical scenario in which we are interested in Bayesian inference is when we have observations of an unknown quantity, okay? So suppose we have a quantity mu, which we wish to observe, and uh, we can only observe with noise because that is the reality. So instead of observing mu, what we observe is uh, mu plus some noise, okay? And typically we're always interested in the scenario where we have uh, multiple observations. So I'll put a little epsilon and little i index. So we observe the quantity x multiple times. And this quantity is obtained from the fixed quantity mu plus a, a random error term, okay? Now the first concept that we need to um, introduce is the so-called i i d assumption, which means independent and identically distributed. I, I, D. What does this mean? This means that every time I do a measurement, I'm drawing epsilon I from the same distribution, which does not depend on I. And in the Gaussian observation case, typically we are going to say, since it is an error term and it's an additive error term, we assume that it's got zero mean. That's the most common assumption made always. And some variance sigma squared. So this is the typical scenario. And the joint probability of the observation, so our likelihood, let's say call it x vector, by x vector I mean the vector of x1, xn, given mu and sigma squared, is going to be a product of terms for each of the xi. So this is the basic setup where <coughs> most of Bayesian inference works. <clears throat> so we have multiple IID measurements and we wish to infer something about our latent variable mu. 
notice that there are uh, situations where the um, where this assumption is not valid. So the IID assumption is not valid. For example, if I'm observing a time series, typically I will not have IID because the time, if it is a dynamical process, the time will play a role. So presumably there will be some correlations in the noise at different time points. Or I might even have systematic errors. For example, I might have groups of variables that have different distributions. So I might be under what is called covariate shift. But that's not what we're going to consider uh, these days. So today, what we're going to look at is given observations, which are IID in this form, how can I compute uh, posterior distributions over the parameters of these Gaussian. Yeah? So I have a likelihood term, which is a product. And then <clears throat> in general, I'll have a prior term, which is a joint distribution over the parameters of the Gaussian. And the question is, what is the posterior distribution given the observations. Remember, this is the posterior. So we use the, the P letter for both the prior, the likelihood, and the posterior. But it should be clear from what is in here that this is a posterior because it's conditioned on the observations. Okay. So let us start first with the mean. Okay. So let's suppose that the sigma squared is fixed and we want to compute the posterior over the mean given the observations and keeping fixed that sigma squared variable, okay? And this is going to be by Bayes' theorem is going to be proportional to the likelihood term times a prior term. Now, if I write it out more explicitly, I will get a normalization constant. And then I have an exponential. Now, my IID assumption means that the likelihood is a product of likelihood terms for each of the observations. And since I'm assuming that the observation noise is Gaussian, then this probability will be written as a, a sum, an exponential of a sum of terms i equals 1 to n okay th so that is my likelihood term and then the prior term is I'm sorry. what is uh, um... Uh, in in the first sentence, you you wrote that uh, PMU x and sigma do is proportional to the P uh, uh, PX. Uh, Did you want that square there? Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for catching me out on the square. And so now, and, and of course. There is another square, even more important square that I missed here. Yeah, x minus x i minus mu squared. Of course, that is the density of a Gaussian. So thank you very much. Uh, now, you can observe that these terms contain a quadratic form in mu. Okay, so it's the exponential of a negative quadratic form in mu. If we want this to turn out to be of uh, a family of distributions that we have encountered before, then this must also be Gaussian. So if you want to be able to do the calculations analytically, we need this thing to be the, the overall joint distribution to have also the form of a quadratic form in mu. And so if we take 
mu to also be Gaussian, then let's say that P of mu, if it is Gaussian, it needs to be a certain, a, a Gaussian with a certain prior parameter M and a certain prior variance S squared, okay? So if we plug that in, So this term remains the same. And then we will have, uh, let's make this a brace. Then we will have mu minus M squared. Now this is also a uh, um, exponential of a quadratic form in mu. And so the posterior distribution is itself also a Gaussian. Okay, so this is the joint distribution, but if I fix the X, because I'm conditioning on it to get the posterior, then I have the exponential of a quadratic, a quadratic form in, in mu. And therefore, the posterior is also Gaussian. So this is the first example of conjugacy. So conjugacy means if the prior is of type A, let's say, Gaussian in this case, then the conjugate likelihood is a distribution. of type B in general, such that the posterior is of type A again. Okay. So there are pairs of distributions, so that if you take a prior from the prior entity and the posterior from this other pair, or other member of the pair, sorry, and the likelihood from this other member of the pair, you will get a posterior, which is of the same form as the prior. Okay, so what we get here is that if you place a Gaussian prior on the mean, and you observe with Gaussian noise, then the posterior is also Gaussian. So the Gaussian is self-conjugate on the mean. So Gaussian is self-conjugate on the mean parameter, okay? So if we have P of mu Gaussian, P of X given mu Gaussian, then P of mu given X is also Gaussian. Yes, so I saw that there was. Uh, something flashing up in the chat. And I've also found a way to. But why can we say that the likelihood is a Gaussian distribution? That, that is just an assumption. It's an assumption that is made. So I'm uh, uh, kind of, it, it is an assumption, but it's also a very standard assumption. And of course, it's a very standard assumption because the Gaussian distribution pops up everywhere because of the central limit theorem. So any observation process that effectively is averaging over multiple independent events will be Gaussian distributed. But the Gaussian also has this very nice property of being self-contributed. So within the Bayesian uh, scenario, 
if you place a prior over the mean that is Gaussian and you have Gaussian observations, the posterior of the mean will also be Gaussian. So here in this calculation, I'm keeping uh, sigma fixed. So I'm just having x given mu. Sigma is to answer to uh, Jitendra's question. So it's x given mu and sigma we are ignoring for the time being. We'll get back to sigma in a minute. So this was the first observation that enables me to in introduce the concept of conjugacy. But what is the actual value of the posterior distribution? Okay, so the posterior distribution is a Gaussian, and so it will have its own statistics. So the statistics will be the posterior mean and variance. So let's see one more question here. Is conjugacy related to the fact that Gaussian is an attractor in PDF space? That is a very uh, deep question, but I, the, the answer is uh, not in any straightforward way because we don't really, uh, I mean, you don't, conjugacy does not only involve Gaussians and we shall see another example in a couple of minutes. And also we're not thinking of, you know, finding the posterior as solving a dynamic system in this case, in an infinite dimensional dynamic system. Writing is not clear, sir. Okay, so. Posterior mean and variance, okay. No, it's not the central limit theorem. Um, well, um, let, let, let's let's uh, uh, remove the attractor in PDF space. At the moment, all we are doing is doing a single Bayesian computation. So we're not uh, having a, a flow on the space of probability distributions at all, in which case it may make sense to talk about attractors. So let's do the calculation on uh, what are the statistics of this posterior, okay? So since the posterior is Gaussian, as we've just seen, so we have that pro probability of mu given X is a Gaussian, and that means it will have uh, its own statistics, yeah? So it is possible to write it as uh, one over Z, X minus a half mu minus m hat divided by s hat squared. Okay. So what will be the value of m hat and s hat? Well, we also know that this has to be equal. That's the calculation we had just done. Exponential of minus a half sum over i of x i minus mu squared divided by sigma squared plus mu minus m squared divided by s squared. So this is the general trick to do calculations with Gaussians in, in a Bayesian fashion. Yeah? So we know that the posterior is a Gaussian, so we can write it as this exponential of a negative quadratic form, but we also have another version that comes from our model. The two distributions have got to be the same, and therefore we should be able to read what the posterior mean and the posterior variance are by simply matching the terms of the relevant degree in this quadratic form. So from the first one, I get that the coefficient of mu squared, from here, I get one over s hat squared. Yeah, that's the only coefficient of mu squared and I'll forget the one half because it's here and here. 
And this must be equal to the coefficient of mu squared here. And here I have a one over S squared. And then I have N times, because I have mu squared in each of these terms, N divided by sigma squared. And that tells me straight away that the posterior variance S hat squared is equal to, uh, well, the inverse of one over S squared plus N over sigma squared. Sorry, you missed the power two. Yes, I missed the power two. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Yes, please. In the second line, uh, we've got the uh, one over the square of the partition function, uh, z, well, partition function z squared. Um, yeah. Why do we have the squared? I mean, why are we supposing that? I, I assume the two z's come from uh, one exponential times the other exponential. But why are we assuming that the two z's are the same? Uh, why do we assume that the two z's are the same? Uh, the, the PDFs will have to be the same. But what is true, uh, and that is what you are kind of, you know, they're not. In fact, I put a hat on the other one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And the reason why they are not, so there was a square that was kind of, you know, a bit of a, uh, as you've seen, sometimes the squares happen in the wrong place and, and miss okay. in the right place. But, okay, yeah. but the, okay. What was so they that, won't be the same. Okay, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. What was this, what, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but was the square uh, at the Z hat uh, an error? Yeah. Oh, okay, I, then I get it, thank you. Yeah, it was a mistake. So this is already an interesting formula. Yeah. And one of the reasons why it's interesting is that it shows us what is the trade-off in the uncertainties. Okay, so the more you observe, so if I let n become very large, so make many observations, then this term here, this second term, will become dominant. Yeah? And since it is to the minus one, I can immediately see that in the Gaussian scenario, in which I have independent and identically distributed um, observations, the posterior variance will collapse when the number of observations becomes large. The posterior variance over the mean parameter, which means the average will become infinitely well determined, okay? Please, what is the difference between Z and Z hat? Uh, they are the normalization constants, but you see the, the reason why they are potentially different is that uh, I have quite a few um, constant terms here that are not explicit here, yeah? so. The, the two things will have to be the same, but here there is going to be an m hat squared divided by s hat squared. And here there will be all sorts of sums of xi squared divided by sigma squared minus uh, plus m squared divided by s squared. In practice, the alternative way to do these posterior computations would be to work out what the various terms here, expand them, then add and subtract a constant term to make sure that this becomes a perfect square in mu, and then you can read what m hat and s hat squared are. That is totally equivalent, but it's a little bit more lengthy, at least from my point of view. And if you do that, then you will see that in order to obtain the normalization constant in this term, well, you have to add and subtract something, which means you have to take some bits out of the, some constants out essentially. So this is not written as a distribution of a mu in its more uh, 
concise form. The every uh, uh, wait 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 okay thanks so can this be thought of as an iterative process start with a guess for prior mean and standard deviation well so Rajat yes it can be thought of as an iterative process precisely because another thing that uh, you know we we can see very well. And, and, and we will see very well in a second when we work out what the, the posterior mean is, is that it depends on the sum of the observations. Yeah? So you take some observations, you compute your posterior. Then if you take some more observations, you can recompute your posterior, keeping the previous one as a prior. So essentially doing Bayesian inference using all the data at the same time or using first a bit of the data and then another bit of the data doesn't change the result. And so it can be seen as an iterative process where you start with a prior belief, you do some observations, you find a posterior, then based on this posterior, you may want to use it as the prior for another batch of observations and that won't change the result. Now there was another question the evidence does not change any assumptions on the probability distribution of the posterior. Um, now, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by the evidence does not change any assumptions on the probability distribution of the posterior. Um, so there are no assumptions on the probability distribution of the posterior. The probability distribution of the posterior is a consequence of the assumptions on the prior and the likelihood. Now the evidence, which is the, the marginal likelihood, will depend on these assumptions. So on what you choose to be your prior and your uh, likelihood, but not on the posterior. Uh, why is the hat in M missing in the last expression? Ah, yeah, or here. Yeah, so here, because this is not the, so the M hat is the posterior mean, but this is the prior mean. So it is actually correct. For once, I've not made a mistake. Uh, Michele, is there for uh, the difference between this iterative approach and the frequentist approach only on the assumption on the prior and the likelihood? Right, so um, the two are, are, are strongly, I mean, the frequentist approach and the Bayesian approach are fundamentally different in the way you interpret the meaning of probabilities. But in practice, many of the results come out very similar. So, you know, here we could think that uh, you know, we are having a, a regularized version. So uh, many people use priors as if they were just providing some regularization so that your results are not too sensitive to finite effects. So when you have few data, you regularize. Um, now the reality, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more um, philosophical very quickly. So let, let's compute the posterior mean as well. Uh, let's get the pen to work again. Okay, there it is. So the posterior mean now requires finding out what m hat is. Yeah? And so to find out what m hat is, I have to compare the coefficients of the linear term in here with the linear term in here. And I'll do this calculation and then I'll get back to the chat. So in here, the linear term has got, well, a minus two, which will be everywhere, but it's essentially uh, going to be m hat divided by s hat squared. That's the coefficient of the linear term in mu in here, yeah, divided by minus two. In here, the coefficients of the linear term in mu, well, will be uh, an m divided by s squared, from here, and then here, 
we will have a sum of xi divided by sigma squared. Okay? So this tells us that the posterior mean is somewhat a weighted mean of the standard mean, let's say, and the prior mean. Okay, so and you can show relatively easily because this essentially will, uh, sorry, here should be a minus two, yeah? because S squared is going like the inverse of um, no, that, that should be a plus two. Yeah? So because S squared is going like the inverse of N, with uh, when the, your sample size becomes large, then basically this term becomes dominant over here. This term tends to become essentially one over n, and this tends to the frequentist mean. Okay. So this is one other connection between the frequentist, the sample mean, which is what the frequentists would report, and the Bayesian. Uh, and the Bayesian uh, equivalent. But notice that when you don't have very large numbers, then M may be important. And so choosing an, choosing an prior that has got parameters that are reasonable can be very important. Now let's go to the chat and see. Oh, OK, good, 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 excellent. Good, so this is when we place a prior on the mean. Now, what about the variance, which is our other parameter? So now priors on the variance. Now, let me define an auxiliary parameter, which is the precision. So the precision is just an alternative parameterization of the Gaussian, which is much more convenient for certain types of calculation, which is the inverse of the variance. So my Gaussian PDF now becomes, um, my observation PDF, for example, now would be uh, P of Xi given mu n sigma squared, I rewrite it as P of Xi given mu and beta squared. And it's going to be one over Z times an exponential of minus a half Xi minus uh, beta squared divided by two Xi minus mu squared. Okay. So now priors on beta squared. Well, notice that beta squared now, my, my distribution, maybe I should write it a little bit bigger because here it's a little bit on the margins. So in fact, I should write it no, I shouldn't write one over z. I should write the full thing here. So so normally it's one over two square root of two pi sigma squared, but here is beta squared because beta is beta squared is the inverse of sigma squared. And so here you notice that the um, likelihood term, 
is a, a product of a, a rational function of beta squared and so uh, something that yeah is actually um, a polynomial uh, mono monomial with rational exponent and a negative exponential of beta squared and so this has a similar shape to the gamma distribution and let me recall that the gamma distribution was uh, So remember that um, P of, um, let's say, uh, Y given uh, theta and lambda is Gaussian distribution that uh, gamma distribution that is one over gamma of theta, gamma function of theta, then it's got uh, something like Y to the, um, minus uh, lambda exp minus theta y. I think, let me double check my gamma uh, probability density function. Uh, yeah, so there is a theta to the minus k as well. Uh, depends how you phrase it. Okay, so. So this would be theta to the minus lambda. And then, uh, and then it should be lambda minus one. is the minus uh the minus one yeah okay so that's the gamma distribution oops no i didn't want to do that Now I've dragged, ah, oh, here it is, good. Good, so this is the gamma distribution. And as you see, if I multiply a gamma with something of this form, which would be a distribution on beta squared, if I multiply it with something of this form, well, I'm just going to have to change by uh, a one half here and my lambda, and I will have to adjust my theta in this way. So if I place a gamma on beta squared, then the posterior gamma prior on beta squared is again gamma. So this is our second conjugacy pair. So uh, if we, on the precision, precision, gamma prior plus Gaussian likelihood brings you to a gamma posterior. And the calculation is again very simple because you'd have to multiply your terms like here, you see it's got a, a rational term and it's got an exponential negative exponential in mind in beta squared and so you would increase by uh, 
this term u theta, and you would uh, uh, increase by one half your lambda. So as you see, it's not that all conjugacy pairs have to incre incre include um, a Gaussian as it's not because it's an attractor in the space of PDFs. In fact, uh, a third example of conjugacy my pen now okay so let n be observed with the Poisson like you with rate mu and let mu be a gamma distributed with theta and lambda. Now recall that the Poisson okay, has as its distribution is uh, the, the probability of, of observing n is um, <clears throat> Uh, mu to the n divided by n factorial e to the minus mu. Okay, and you can see immediately that again it's got a power of mu times a negative exponential of mu. So if you multiply with the gamma with the gamma, which would be uh, of the form one over gamma of theta, theta to the minus lambda. And then we would have uh, mu to the lambda minus one exp uh, minus uh, mu divided by theta. You know, if I take the product of these two terms, well, all I'm doing is adding n to lambda and subtracting uh, one to one over theta. So again, Poisson, gamma plus Poisson leads to gamma. Okay. Now, um, Finally, the, uh, there is obviously a question at the moment. So uh, we have looked at what happens if we want to do Bayesian computations on the mean. And we've seen that if we keep the variance fixed and we place a Gaussian prior on the mean, then we are going to get a Gaussian posterior on the uh, mean itself. We've also seen, although we've not done the explicit, uh, and we found out that in fact, this makes uh, a lot of sense. You're going to get out posterior parameters that are very clearly interpretable. So the variance shrinks to zero when you have an infinite amount of data. The uh, posterior mean is uh, very close to what would be the sample mean, particularly when the number of data points becomes large. We've seen, although we've not done the calculations, that uh, if you keep the mean fixed and you place a, and you reparameterize your uh, Gaussian distributions in terms of um, precision, a gamma prior on the precision is conjugate to a Gaussian likelihood. So you get a posterior on the precision that is again gamma. But of course, 
in general, so so what what happens if you don't keep the precision fixed when you're trying to be Bayesian over the mean? So what if you treat them both as random variables? So the natural question is being Bayesian. on both mu and beta squared, okay? So here, then you, you still have your likelihood, which is your probability of xi given mu sigma squared, and this will be one over, uh, well, square root of beta squared divided by two pi x minus a half minus beta squared divided by two x i minus mu squared. But now you see the likelihood couples the two parameters, yeah? So they appear as a product. So independent priors, uh, I mean, the posterior will not be independent between mu and beta. Okay. So the kind of treatment we've done so far is uh, a rather um, artificial one. So it turns out that you need to define a joint prior over mu and sigma squared. Oh, sorry, yeah. sigma squared, beta squared. You can do the whole thing with sigma, of course. The distribution is called the inverse gamma as opposed to the gamma because it's a gamma distribution of an inverse of the random variable. And you have, the, there is a special distribution which is called the normal gamma. Okay, and this is a, is a, is a combination of a normal distribution and, and the gamma distribution. So it's a distribution over uh, pairs of random variables, one of which needs to be positive and the other one needs to be uh, real. And uh, you can, uh, you know, it's essentially a product of the, um, product of a Gaussian and a gamma, but the Gaussian terms also contains the gamma variable, okay? So normal gamma distribution is the conjugate prior. I'm not going to do the calculations here. They become a little bit more complicated. The one thing that I want to um, tell you though, and it's the final thing that I want to tell you today, is that you can also compute um, marginals. Okay, so so now suppose that you have again your Gaussian distribution on the, your Gaussian likelihood, and you have placed um, a conjugate prior. So you have placed a Gaussian on mu and you keep sigma squared fixed. You can also compute what would be the uh, marginal um, distribution of X if you marginalized out mu using this distribution. So the marginal P of xi given sigma squared m and s squared. Now, what will it be? Well, it's pretty clear that it's going to be another Gaussian because you have a joint Gaussian and you're marginalizing out. So you have a you know your your joint distribution over um, x and mu, yeah, which was written here, is uh, 
is a quadratic negative quadratic form in both x and mu, so it's a joint Gaussian. And you know that when you marginalize out one entry of a Gaussian, of a joint Gaussian, then you end up with a Gaussian on the remaining variable. Yeah? What Gaussian will it be? So what will its parameters be? Well, we have that Xi is obtained from mu plus IID Gaussian noise. So we can compute, I mean, we can do the integral and that's rather painful, or we can compute the two moments of this distribution. So the expectation of Xi is going to be equal to, uh, well, the expectation of. Excuse me, over, so over what, over, over what variable are we marginalizing to get mu. the PSI given sigma squared yeah. MS squared? So we're marginalizing mu. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, and this is going to be equal to, um, so here we're marginalizing mu, so expectation of a mu and also of a, uh, x. And oh, sorry, over epsilon really. The expectation of epsilon is zero and the expectation of mu is m, okay? Now we have to find the expectation of xi squared. And once again, doing almost exactly the same calculation, well, doing really the same calculation that we did before, uh, I think last time. Now we have to write out what this square of this term would be. Mu squared plus mu epsilon i plus epsilon i squared. Now these terms, since uh, epsilon is independent of mu and epsilon has got zero mean, will give you zero. This term is the second moment of mu and the second moment of mu, well, the variance is the second moment minus the square of the first moment. So this is S squared plus M squared. And the second moment of epsilon is sigma squared because it's got zero mean. Uh, sorry, that's not an epsilon, that's an S. Okay, so the variance of Xi is S As, let's write it properly. S squared plus sigma squared. And so you see that when we have our observation process and we marginalize out mu, we are adding the two uncertainties. So we are uncertain of a mu by an amount S squared. And we are uncertain given, given mu X has its own uncertainty, which is sigma squared. So when we marginalize, we sum the uncertainties, which makes perfect sense. Yeah, on average, we sum the uncertainties. So this is another um, nice property of uh, Gaussians that when you marginalize, you sum uncertainties. What about marginalizing the variance? Ah, oh, there is a question. Uh, e of x m squared. Uh, why is e of x m squared? Oh, did I did I write something nonsensical? No, no. E of x is yeah, because e of x is e of mu plus e of epsilon. e of epsilon is zero and e of mu is m. So e of x is not m squared, it's oh, m. e of x squared is 
S squared, E of mu squared is S squared plus M squared. Good. So what about, uh, no, I don't want to create one more sheet. What about marginalizing mu and sigma together? So you have your P of X given mu sigma squared, and you have a prior which is a joint prior or mu sigma squared, which is normal inverse gamma, which is the conjugate prior. Or you parameterize this by beta squared and you place a normal gamma prior. Well, the calculations are a little bit intricate, but the marginal is distributed according to a so-called student T distribution, which some of you might have heard and is the distribution that um, underlies the, the t-test in classical statistics was invented by this guy which went by the pseudonym of student to do quality control of beer in the Guinness brewery and, and all of these fun things and it's obtained by taking a Gaussian and marginalizing mean and variance using a normal inverse gamma prior. So, uh, question, can I go back a slide? Yes, sure. So the, 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 the key thing here is that the second moment is the variance plus the square of the first moment. Okay, that's where the M squared came. Okay, so today we've seen uh, the basics of, uh, well, and you know, it goes quite a long way. There aren't many more Bayesian calculations you can do with Gaussians, but they are the kind of the foundations of many Bayesian calculations you may want to do later on. And they kind of give you also uh, a convenient way to understand what Bayesian computations return in comparison to the standard uh, frequentist computations where you take sample means and sample variances. Yeah? So a very profitable, insightful way of thinking of it is that Bayes, in some sense, regularizes your results when you don't have much data. Uh, but another way to think about it is that if you are uh, genuinely believing in the um, in the expert, then the expert, when you have little data, can give you very precious information about what your true statistics, what your inferred statistics should be. Uh, most other cases, in, in all cases where you can compute conjugacy, so when you can compute analytically posterior, this is possible to do. So Poisson, likelihood, gamma prior, you can do it, but unfortunately, there aren't that many cases. They all fall into the broad class of exponential family distribution. So conjugacy exists only in the exponential family and it involves a handful of other distributions. For complex models, these analytical calculations, which are insightful, but they're just impossible. After marginalizing one of the variables, the resulting distribution would always have a Gaussian form. No, no. So if you marginalize if you have a joint Gaussian distribution and you marginalize any of the variables, then you always end up with a Gaussian. But if you have something that is not jointly Gaussian, like for example, a distribution, a normal gamma distribution where you have a product of a gamma and a Gaussian which are coupled, then you won't get a Gaussian. In fact, what you get by marginalizing the variance in um, a Gaussian normal gamma, uh, normal gamma uh, prior is a student T, which is something that has a higher tail of the distribution, which is the interesting thing. So 
You see, when you marginalize the mean, you sum the variance, but the long term, let's say, behavior. So the, the, the behavior of distance from the mean is the same. So it's decaying with e to the minus x squared. When you marginalize the variance, it decays as e to the minus x, which is different because it's a, it's a scale mixture, essentially. Oh. Yeah, is the choice of the shape of priors like Gaussian only driven by necessity uh, or there are other reasons? Uh, well, for what we are seeing now, it's only driven by necessity, to be honest. If you don't choose them, so, so it's driven by necessity and also by pedagogical reasons that doing the calculations analytically shed some light into what is going on during the inference procedure. The reality is that you will never have conjugacy in any model that you generally believe to be a model of the world. And there are other techniques for computing approximations to the posterior. But unfortunately, it's not so clear what is going on. So this will be a more advanced course. We may mention them at the very end, but that's um, for today is for certain. We are just looking at choosing priors so that we can do the calculations. So I think it's uh, coffee break time. And if there are no more questions or there are still some more things in there, how can we figure the exact value of the variables? Ah, well, okay. So the student t distribution, for example, has got its own expectations that can be computed analytically. So, you know, the exact value of the variable, what you mean is the statistics of the posterior distribution. And you can compute statistics for more distributions than just the Gaussian. Okay, so for example, for a student T, you can as well. But in general, you're absolutely right. If you can't compute analytically the posterior, then the only way you can get at statistics is by doing approximations to these distributions and mostly you approximate them as a collection of samples. Now I see Matteo has resurfaced. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Guido. And um, 